Thanks a lot for having me, guys. I really appreciate this. This is a really fun day to be part of, and uh, certainly good crowd, a lot of interesting talks that I'm uh, eager to hear myself. Um, so as you mentioned, I wanted to talk about uh, how you build products on the backs of other product experiences. And the more I got into this topic, my focus from it was less moved from the, uh, the user experience side of it to, to more how do you identify the business opportunities that are presented on the backs of other products. Um, and you know, we're all in this room today because we share common interests. You know, we're, we're looking for new ideas. We're looking for new problems and challenges that we can solve in our, in our businesses or in our studies. Um, and we're looking for new opportunities around which that we can uh, grow or launch businesses. And so you know, each passing year, platforms are playing a larger and larger role in our lives. Um, years ago, it was really around, platforms were really focused around connecting with people. They allowed you to you know, find like-minded strangers or friends, connect with them and communicate with them online. Um, then platforms really emerged to, uh, to help people create and consume content. So they gave you the tools you needed to create videos, write, um, share, take, take and share photos, and then created networks around them to get that content consumed. The next kind of evolution of platforms was really around uh, creating uh, connecting buyers and sellers. So it was marketplaces like Shopify, Airbnb, Uber, they provided tools for service, service providers to sell their services and connect with an audience who was actually gonna purchase and consume that, those goods and services. Um, and today, more and more, we're starting to see the platforms that under, platforms are the things that under, underlie all the communications that we do in our day to day, from our work with Slack, uh, to chatting with our friends, to flirting on Snapchat, I assume. I assume that's what people do on Snapchat. Um, and so more and more businesses that emerge are going to be built on the backs of these platforms. Um, you're starting to see it already, but because they are they're, we're gonna, they are taking up uh, a bigger and bigger place in our lives, you're gonna see more and more opportunities created, up, created out of that and more businesses built based on that. So um, building, on the, building on the backs of a plat another platform is a really unique challenge because you're not building in isolation. So you think of a product idea on its own, um, it doesn't have any real constraints about it. It can do or be anything. If you're building on the backs of a platform, it comes with an already set customer base, it already it comes with a set user experience, and this creates and shapes the context in which you actually have to build, build your business and build your product in. Um, and so, you know, before jumping into even how you identify opportunities that are created uh, on platforms for new businesses, it's really important to understand how platforms themselves actually work. So, you know, the, the biggest question is, that might not actually have a complete 100% perfect answer, is what's the difference between a product and a platform? Um, because all products at one point in time typically start out as platforms and then evolve there. Uh, it's, there's a, a bit of a gray area between the two. So, as it's defined, a product is something that is built and delivered directly to a consumer. Uh, from a bar of soap, that Unilever creates in their factory and sells, sells to their customers to uh, a software as a service product. Those are, all, those are all products by definition because it is a direct one-to-one -one relationship between the creator and the consumer. Platforms, on the other hand, are, uh, they're focused on facilitation. They give tools for people to create products, create value, and then they, create, they give a network and connections for those people to be able to deliver those products to an audience. So um, they rely on value creators to come onto their platform and really create the value for them. Uh, value creator is everyone from like a, a, a Instagram celebrity. They are creating value for Instagram. They're creating the content there. Um, it's app developers who are on Apple's, plat on Apple's uh, app store. It's, brick and mortar businesses that are selling, selling products. So perhaps the simplest way to exemplify what the difference is is with some actual practical experiences. So, ah, there we go. So Holiday Inn. Holiday Inn, 
wonderful company. They build, they build hotel rooms and they sell hotel rooms to guests. They own that entire flow. That is their business. They are selling products and that product is a hotel room. Airbnb, on the other hand, they have built a platform on which homeowners can list their homes. They have given them payment tools on which they can collect payments from guests. They've given them a marketplace in which they can find guests. And then they've given them a review system that, that allows them to collect feedback and further generate matches on their platform. So they don't own a single hotel room. They don't own a single building. And yet they have built a, uh, a hotel platform that is greater than what Holiday Inn, Inn has done just by building a platform instead of selling product. Another example would be Squarespace. Squarespace is a content management system. It allows people to build and, build and uh, launch websites. Very straightforward. Tumblr, on the other hand, is another tool. It allows people to build and create websites, but it also has a built-in social, uh, social community for people to share and discover content. Um, and then it uses all of the data that's created through, that, through those interactions to suggest new content for you. So they are, again, putting the tools out there getting people onto their platform to really come and create all that value for them. Finally, um, Nike. Nike, they manufacture pairs of shoes for you and then they put them in Foot Locker and you go and buy them at Foot Locker. It's just a straight kind of business to consumer relationship. They are selling you a product. Nike Plus, on the other hand, they are tracking all of your data every time you go for a run. They're taking that data. They're sharing it with your friends. Uh, on, the, on their platform, they're getting, you to, getting your friends to encourage you as you run. Uh, they're suggesting new routes for you based on that data. Again, this is them putting tools out there that are allowing people to create content, create product, create value on their platform. So of the companies that have become massive, massive platforms that you'll know today, very few of them actually start out that way. Um, Uber is the notable exception where they launched as a platform, but even, even Google didn't start as a platform, and Google's probably the biggest platform that anyone, ever, anyone's seen. Um, Google actually started out by licensing their service to Yahoo to run their search engine. And then they evolved from there and realized they could get bigger and larger by creating tools for people to generate value for them. Um, so. Most, most platforms start as a product, but then shift their business model. And uh, it's a good, interesting uh, story from Snapchat this week. I don't know if anyone was following along with this, but they went through their IPO this week. In their, uh, in their documentation and leading up to the IPO, they had to describe what their service was. They described their service as um, they were a camera products company. And this just made everybody freak out because all the people who invested millions and billions of dollars to get them where they were thought they were a platform, thought that they were a set of tools that was going to open, open up for content creators and it was just going to turn into this revenue generating machine. So they've kind of backpedaled, but everything went well. Their OP IPO launched. They became rich. Don't worry. But it is a good kind of cautionary tale to highlight the difference between, you know, there is a meaningful difference between the business model of a product and a business model of a platform. So for us, as the content creators, builders um, of businesses sitting in this room today, platforms really matter because they can offer us, you know, new businesses, growing businesses, what we need the most, and that's access to customers. Uh, customers are what drives uh, drives growth and it's what drives revenue. So that is really the single greatest challenge for new businesses when they're getting up and running is how do you get access to customers? This is a real turnkey way by looking at what are the opportunities on a platform that we can build off of and solve for because they already have accumulated millions of customers and they are provi providing that opportunity. They want you to come build on their platform. So go where the users go. Now, conventional wisdom suggests that maybe building on platforms isn't a great idea because um, platforms are businesses on their own and they have their own priorities and those priorities can change and really crush you. Uh, this is Meerkat. This was Meerkat. Um, I don't know how many people in here used Meerkat. It was around in 2015, so I might be dating myself here, but um, the idea behind Meerkat 
was it was built off the back of Twitter. Um, it was a tool that allowed you to live stream whatever you were doing to your Twitter following. It was huge, blew up over the course of a month, hundreds of thousands of users. They raised $12 million Series B just based off all that traffic in one month. Twitter saw this and was going, huh, why aren't we doing that? And so they changed the regulations and terms of services about building on their platform, completely cut off Meerkat, and then about a month later, launched their own competitor, Periscope, and a year later, Meerkat was dead. This big, beautiful, growing business, dead in the matter of a year, just because they were too reliant on building on a platform. So there is some risk in, inherent in building on it. Don't let that dissuade you, though. There are many, many good examples of when it goes well. This is Airbnb. This is the old Airbnb, like the 10 years ago Airbnb. And this is when they were just getting off the ground. And they were really, really reliant on Craigslist to get up and running. Because if you were alive in 2004, or what, 20, 2004 and you wanted to rent out your house, you rented it out on Craigslist. And so they were trying to find that audience. They had to work on the back of Craigslist to capture that audience. So anytime you created a post on Airbnb, they gave you the option to share that post on Craigslist, too. Uh, they even scraped all the user data from Craigslist to uh, put onto Airbnb. So they were really, really reliant on that, but it helped them get that like, key early growth that allowed their business to survive and really grow to become a standalone product. And so the kind of the big moral of the story in building on the back of a platform is that you don't want to forever remain a feature for it. You're trying to build a business, but it's okay to start there because it allows you that access to customers that's gonna get you up off the ground, get you up and running, and allow your business kind of a longer term chance of success. All right, so that's what a platform is. Next is really important to understand kind of the structure and purpose of the platform you're looking at. So platforms face the same challenges that all product and service businesses do. They, uh, they need to keep their customers engaged. Being a platform allows others to create functionality for them on there, keep people more interested, more active on their site. They need, they need to build more things. Uh, any business, they only have so much capacity to do so many things when their roadmap is twice, a, twice the length of what they can actually achieve. So by opening up themselves as a platform, they're actually outsourcing a lot of feature development for their own product. Um, to, to, to revenue, so how do you make more money? Having others create value for you in your ecosystem is the simplest way to do it. You know, why go and try and make money for yourself when others can do it for you? By enabling other people to do it, taking percentages, commissions here and there off of the services that go through your platform, they're actually opening up a new, exponentially larger uh, revenue stream than they could ever find elsewhere. A good example of this is the iPhone when it was first released. The iPhone came with 10 apps on it. You could check your stocks, you could check the weather. It was fun. Um, but then they launched the, Apple, the, the App Store, and that allowed all the developers, businesses, to build products for their phone, and that actually increased their revenue tenfold over just selling the device. So being a product company and just selling a device, to, a phone to customers, that made them a billion dollar business. Being, opening up the app store and getting people to build products and services on their back, that made them a $10 billion business. And finally, uh, distribution. So how do you get your product in the hands of more customers? Interestingly for platforms, opening, up, uh, opening themselves up to new products and services to be built on them allows them to get access to new and different communities because there are niche communities, there are uh, tangential audiences that people will build, build off services for that they would never go for because they're too small. But for them it is important because it is a new channel to acquire customers. So when you're looking at why, are plat why do platforms do this, why do they open so themselves up, it's for all of these reasons that any business does, but they're just trying to do it at scale. So how a platform is actually structured will give you kind of a clear indication of how they want people to build on it. So there is this great concept uh, by Sanjeet Paul Chowdhury, and it's called the platform stack. It's in the book Platform Scale. I would highly recommend reading it. 
The concept behind this is this is the structure that every platform is built on. Every platform has it. It just comes in various ratios depending on what the goal of their platform is. So the stack includes a marketplace network community layer. This is where all of your customers live. This is where the relationships that they have, all of the interactions that they have between each other, this is where all of that takes place. So on Instagram, this is where the, follow, or where the photographer interacts with the person following with them. This is where the likes happen. This is where the followings happen. It's about having that ecosystem where people can connect and interact with each other. The next layer is infrastructure. Um, these are the tools and services that allow, enable other people to create content, create value, create products on the back of your platform. So again, going back to Apple's example, they developed Swift. Swift is a coding language that allows you to, to build uh, applications for, for iOS. That is, a, that is part of the infrastructure that they have created to allow others on their platform. The App Store itself, that's part of this infrastructure. So it's about putting tools in the hands of people uh, that can do something with them. And then final layer is data. And so this is all of the this is all the accrued information about the users, their interactions, their engagements that happen on a platform. And that is incredibly valuable information because platforms at the scale they're at have such massive data sets that you can actually take that information and build new and interesting things, learn new and interesting things from that data. So every time you go for a run and Fitbit tracks your data, that's actually, that's actually contributing to the Fitbit platform because you're making this data set available for others to build off of it, whether it's new product companies or scientists to take that information and learn about human behaviors. Um, yeah. So every single, product, every single platform has the same elephant, or elements. Um, they just have them in different proportions. And so again, based on how they proportion out their different layers of their product stack, you can get a sense of where do they want you, in, where do they want you building on their platform. So looking at Shopify, for example, they have some network effects, but they generally let, uh, they let, generally let buyers and sellers in, interact on their platform all on their own. They don't really moderate that experience any, in any way. At the data layer, they do offer some data up to the, sh to the store owners based on their traffic and the, the activity on their accounts, but that data isn't made widely available for people to consume. So it's actually this middle layer that, that Shopify really focuses on. They have an app marketplace that they encourage developers to build products for. They have an expansive API on which you can take their products and change them and modify them, and build them and grow them and evolve them. They have developer tools to actually allow you to build within their environments because they do have a unique environment of their own. And they have code libraries that helps you get started, get up and running quicker. Uh, all of these tools are designed to encourage, to make it super simple for people to get up and running on a platform. Now, understanding the structure of the platform on which you will build is going to better enable you to identify opportunities. Looking at how Shopify is structured, it's clear they want you to uh, build out their infrastructure. They want you to add new functionality there for the buyers, the sellers. They want you to expand their platform beyond what they can do with their own team. So now that we have a good understanding of how platforms work um, and, and where they want you to add value, how do we identify opportunities that are present on those platforms? So there are a number of tools and exercises that are really great at this. Um, customer journey mapping, uh, customer research, service mapping, all of these things that are really part of a designer's toolkit are excellent for this. So instead, I want to look at um, how changing, how, how change, how platforms affect changes to uh, customers' behaviors, technical adoption, and social, social norms. And that's really the best place that you can start looking at the high level for where platforms are providing new opportunities to build businesses. So first thing, though, it's important to understand that when you look at a platform, you want to look at both sides of the platform. They generally have consumers, consumers of content, and producers of content. You want to be building for both. So I know it's sexier to build for the rider in an Uber, uh, but the driver is really the one that has a lot of problems because they have the, they have the largest changing context. They have the largest, cha you know, 
They have new ways of getting paid. They have new employers. They have a whole new career right now and a new set of competition because UberX is bringing new drivers uh, into the transportation industry. And so platforms can really change the way that both consumers and producers li live in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, the biggest one, or sorry, platforms can normalize new behaviors. So the first one is the idea that you, know, you like things now. That was not a thing that people did two years ago, or sorry, six years ago, but then you know, through Facebook, through Twitter, through Instagram, liking has become just this extremely normal activity that everyone does. They have, these platforms have made that a day-to-day -day average activity. Um, platforms can also dra rapidly dr uh, drive the adoption of new technologies. So opening up an app, the Apple App Store suddenly made it the single most relevant uh, platform or channel on which you had to build your products. Every developer switched their attention to building building uh, iOS apps because that was the new channel and technology that you had to be on. And finally, they can lead to significant social uh, changes to society. And you know, a great example of this is how, how much dating has changed uh, with the invention of Tinder. It's no longer, you're no longer there find, meeting people at bars. You are now uh, looking at a headshot and pressing a check mark. So Uber is actually the best example of uh, a business that is creating this changes in these areas. So I want to just run through a, a couple quick examples. So Uber has brought the on-demand uh, on -demand economy to the mainstream. So while they were not the first ones to do it, they were certainly the ones that brought it to the majority of people. Um, the ability to order a cab and have it show up within you know, five minutes in your house has given you the expectation that every single service should be as uh, as quick, as reliable, and as convenient as Uber is. And so after, shortly after it went to mainstream, you started seeing Uber for X pop up everywhere. You had the Uber for chocolates, the Uber for lighting, the Uber for bath bathrooms. All of these things, uh, everyone was trying to create on-demand services because this is a new behavior that people expected. Amazon took this shift and went to the extreme with it. They boiled it down to a single button where it's, I'm out of Heineken, I need a Heineken, I press this button, and Heineken gets delivered to my door. Um, but other, other, plat or other businesses built on this idea in much more meaningful ways. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with Honor, but it's a on-demand service for home care providers for elderly people. And the whole concept that you'd have to order a stranger to your door to help your grandmother go shopping uh, was crazy five years ago. But because of our changing behavior, how Uber is really changing our behaviors, we're so much more comfortable with the ideas of strangers delivering these services that we're now entrusting our wonderful dear grandmother into the hands of that stranger to take her shopping. Um, Uber introduced new technologies. So the infrastructure that they created uh, has became the, become the platform for delivering anything in under 10 minutes. They allow you to get anything anywhere in under 10 minutes, and that is what they're really selling at the technology layer. They have made this a default uh, tool in businesses' toolkits now. And this was great for many reasons. Um, some people took it a little too far, though, and Uber is really uh, was adopted by the drug dealing industry as the default way to get your product shipped. And so it's not always social good that happens from it, but it can, where someone like Jobcase, for instance, they take, uh, they take your driver's ratings and list, uh, your ratings and reviews and actually turn that, build that into their uh, hiring platform and use that, use that as a reference point. So they're helping draw, uh, Uber drivers turn their reputation from Uber into a career. And finally, um, Really, the shape of the workforce is undergoing a massive change. Less and less people uh, will have a nine to, nine to five career moving forward. And this is the whole idea of the gig economy, where as opposed to having a career, you're going to have a series of kind of part-time consulting work. You're going to drive a car, you're going to deliver some food, you're going to go do some handyman work, and that will comprise your day. And whether it's a good thing or not, it's happening. And Uber was really the one that drove this behavior change. And what you're seeing as a reaction to that is new businesses popping up because of the opportunity that creates. 
these people who once had nine to five jobs, they had 401ks, they had health benefits, they had, uh, they had retirement plans, have those things no longer because they are just independent contractors. So businesses are starting up to, uh, financial services are starting up to support drivers, to support Airbnb hosts, to support uh, Uber Eats delivery people, to give them 401ks, to give them, uh, to give them financial services. So it's interesting to see that this social change that's happening is really driving this whole new industry of services for, services for platform providers. So just a quick recap. Um, platforms do represent a huge opportunity um, as a starting point for us to new, uh, build new businesses. Understanding how a platform is structured lets you identify where they want you to be building on it. Identifying opportunities that come from the, identify opportunities that come from the behavioral shifts, the technology shifts, and the social shifts that these platforms are creating to really find a great starting point around which you can build a business. And from that, we can identify many new great opportunities that we can all build businesses off of. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Rob. Maybe we'll take uh, a quick question from the crowd. Yeah, Emma. So that was really interesting. Thank you so much. I wanted to ask from the perspective of business owners because you touched upon this from the perspective of the employee. What are the key implications for that tweet you put up at the beginning, meaning that? new businesses are coming into something like Y Combinator, mostly offering a platform now. So what would be the key implications for the business owner mm -hmm. of either creating that platform or owning that platform already? So I think, the, I, I think that comment was directed towards uh, early stage businesses, businesses that really come out of the gates as identifying as platforms. And the thing that makes a platform successful is they already have a ton of users, they already have uh, a ton of revenue going through it. They already have a significant product uh, feature set built around it that will attract others to build on top of it. Businesses that are coming right out of the gates as a platform don't have any of that scale, so they're gonna have a really hard time attracting people to build on that platform. And so I think that was kind of the, the warning that Paul Graham was giving there is build a product, a successful product first, then figure out how to turn that into a platform. Awesome. Thank you very much, Rob. Yeah.